Thank you very much. And uh, I have the big conflict of interest, but I hope that uh, the science drives the innovation rather than the, way, the other way around. So I invented the device I'm about to tell you about, but it's been based out of the USA for the last couple of years, last several years. Um, so this is a device for treatment of a condition that many of you, but not all of you, will have heard of called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And so I just wanted to introduce the concept of diastolic heart failure very briefly. So uh, everyone knows that if your heart is flabby and weak, it won't sustain the cardiac output. Less well appreciated is that if you've got a fibrosed heart or an overhypertrophied heart, it can pump very well, it just doesn't relax very well between beats, and that can be a dangerous condition as well. It can cause lots of symptoms, it can cause arrhythmia, it can cause hospitalisation, and it can cause death. And so if you look at the data, there are just two really interesting things about diastolic heart failure epidemiology and the term HEFPEF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has largely replaced the term diastolic heart failure or DHF. Firstly, the disease is becoming more frequent because of its fellow travellers of increased age and increased body mass index. And secondly, if you compare it to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, the heart failure we all are used to, the hospitalizations for HEF-PEF in red are going up, whereas those for HEF-REF are going down. So this is an increasing problem that all of us are seeing much more of. And what's really surprising is how bad the outlook is. And this isn't just one study. This is the New England Journal of Medicine paper from uh, the Mayo Clinic group. But the prognosis in HEF-PEF is just as bad as HEF-REF. This is a condition that is really dangerous to have. So, um, lots of people, not surprisingly, because it's common, getting commoner and serious, have tried lots of ways to get around it, and every drug trial that's been tried has failed. And they're listed here, and you know, millions, countless millions of dollars and, uh, and hours have been spent on these trials that have all been neutral. And I don't know if I've included TopCat there, I haven't put Topcat. Topcat's a really interesting one. It was aldosterone for HEFPEF, also a neutral trial. Maybe a sniff of benefit because there were two main centres. There were those centres in North America where spironolactone seemed to be good for you if you had HEFPEF, and Georgia and Russia where it seemed to be bad with you because as opposed to what they do with their athletes, they probably didn't give them the drug at all. No, no, they, 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 they didn't have the disease. The people in Georgia and Russia who were enrolled in TopCat uh, actually didn't have the disease, and so it was hardly surprising that the drug didn't work. So... Um, Complex, but I think we're left with diuretics on the evidence base. And here's an interesting matrix for you. If you look at systolic heart failure in the left column and diastolic in the right, medications on the top row, devices in the bottom row, systolic heart failure, lots and lots of proven drugs, and a few really interesting devices, defibrillators and cardiac resynchro, as well as VADs. In diastolic heart failure, what we've got a lot of negative trials and absolutely no devices. So it's a pretty barren landscape if you happen to be one of the zillions of people with diastolic heart failure. Now, when we started thinking about this, there are lots of reasons why you might have a stiff LV. But the common denominator is you have an elevated left atrial pressure. That's what drives the symptoms, it's what drives the atrial fibrillation, it's what drives the hospitalizations, and it's what drives the death by causing dyspnea and pulmonary edema. And there are a few clues to what you might be able to do about higher left atrial pressure that come from the literature and from our knowledge of pathophysiology. Firstly, there was a very interesting observation made over 100 years ago that if you've got an ASD and mitral stenosis, you do much better than if you've just got mitral stenosis without an ASD. Uh, that's got a name, it's called Lutenbache syndrome. And it, it's because if you've got mitral stenosis and a high left atrial pressure, but you've also got an ASD, the high left atrial pressure can blow off to the right side, so instead of getting pulmonary edema, you get a big right heart, but you don't die and you don't get pulmonary edema. Then there's a very unusual condition, children who are born with a single ventricle heart who have an operation called the Fontan procedure. It turns out if you leave a little hole in the atrial septum for them, they get into a lot less trouble. Now, many of you will know that for people with advanced pulmonary arterial hypertension, 
we sometimes deliberately make a hole in the atrial septum because if you've got a failing right ventricle, if you make a little hole in the atrial septum, a little bit of blood can go from the right side to the left side and you'll decompress the right heart. So those patients, they're a bit cyanosed, but they don't get right heart failure. And so that's been an interesting experiment. And finally, on the next slide, I'll show you that if you... We sometimes ask to close atrial septal defects in people who have got HEFPEF, stiff LVs, and that's a bad thing to do. And this is an interesting observation was first made by Peter Hewitt and Peter Lange. And what they found was here's the atrial pressure of about 10 or 12 in someone who they were asked to close an ASD and who had a stiff left ventricle uh, from hypertension. And here's what happened when they actually closed the ASD. So when they closed the ASD, the left atrial pressure went up from 12 to 25 and the person got breathless. And so it stands to reason that maybe you can do exactly the opposite of that. You have someone with HEFPEF and you make a controlled atrial septal defect and you lower their left atrial pressure. Now the price you'll pay for that is a little bit of right heart volume overload, but as you'll see, it's much better to have 20% extra flow through your right heart if you've got 50% less extra pressure in your left atrium. So our hypothesis was that creating a left to right shunt might lower LA pressure at rest or during exercise and hence reduce symptoms in patients with this condition known as HEFPEF. So we developed a transcatheter implant to create a small, and I'll come back to small in a moment, permanent intraatrial shunt, and the shunt is designed to allow blood to flow from the higher pressure LA to the lower pressure, more compliant right side, reducing LAP without compromising forward cardiac output, and thereby reducing the symptoms of HEFPEF. Now, how much you open that hole is critical. I can see some of you thinking, God, you've got to make a hole in the heart. What, what, are they, what do they think of next? So, you know, the two, the two big worries with that, three big worries, it's like the Spanish Inquisition, no one expects three big worries. Um, the first is that you might blow out the right heart. The second is that the left heart might need the preload to drive cardiac output. And the third is you might open people up to the possibility of paradoxical embolus. Last one first, paradoxical embolus not a problem because they've got so much left to right flow because they've got high LA pressure that they don't shunt right to left. It turns out that cardiac output's all right, and it turns out that pulmonary pressure's all right, and I'll show you the data to support that. This is what the device looks like. It's got an outer diameter of 19 millimetres and an inner diameter of 8 millimetres, so the size of the ASD you make is 8 millimetres, and I'll show you why in a minute. And that's a view from a left atrium of an animal that we implanted and that we kept alive for a year, and then we wanted to check that there was no bad reason to have that in, and there isn't. Now, Dan Burkhoff with David K. David K is from Melbourne. Many of you will know him. Dan Burkhoff has this very accurate computer simulation model, which he helped us out with. And what it shows is if you've got an LA pressure that's higher than your RA pressure from a stiff ventricle at rest, on exercise, the left atrial pressure really goes up very high very quickly. And many of you who've exercised patients in the cath lab will know that it's not uncommon at 30 or 40 watts for someone to have an LA pressure of 35, even if their LA pressure at rest has been 10. So exercise hemodynamics is important. And what Dan and David were able to illustrate is that if you simulate making this 8 millimeter atrial septal defect, you can see on the top right here, these are the data from exercise at rest. If you make this small hole, the LA pressure, instead of going up to 25, goes up to 13. Now, the RA pressure, instead of being 8, is 12. And the shunt goes up when you exercise. But the question is, are you better off having that situation than that situation if you're a human with HEFPEF? Why did we choose an 8 millimetre hole? This is a slightly complex slide, and those of you who are interested can look at David Kay's paper. But it turns out that that's the sweet spot. That's the spot at which you get the best decompression of the left atrium, but the least load on the right heart and the least decrement in cardiac output. So a lot of thought went into, and a lot of physics and physiology went into, the choice of atrial septal defect size. So wedge pressure reduction and shunt flow both plateau at that sort of intraatrial septal defect diameter. Um, we had some really clever engineers working on a lovely fail-safe nice handle to pop it out. And I'll show you how it works in a moment. So this is, this is when you put this device in. 
This company used to be called DC Devices, which has nothing to do with David Salomire. It stands for decompression. Uh, no, it's, I've, had, I've had you uh, fooled you at last. Okay. So um, one of those fancy animations you get from America, you put in your transeptal catheter, you balloon it up a bit to get it to eight millimeters, and this is a very easy procedure. Just pop a balloon in, and then you take out the catheter, but you leave in the wire, you put in your sheath um, with a dilator, you take out the dilator, the sheath is 14 French, but it goes through a femoral vein, so that's not a problem. Here are the left atrial legs being deployed on the left atrial side. It's got a very low profile. Then you can come back and pull the guiding sheath back a little more. The right atrial legs are deployed, and then you take everything out, and you've got this decompression. And one of the nice things about it is, of course, when you exercise, when you're resting and your LARA pressure gradient is five millimetres mercury, the shunt is very small. When you start to exercise, the LA pressure goes up and your shunt is a bit bigger, but only for a short period of time. When you're asleep in the middle of the night and your heart rate goes down and your blood pressure goes up because you're having a bad dream or you have sleep apnea, for that hour or so that that happens, instead of going into pulmonary edema, you just have 20% more flow through your right ventricle and you sleep through instead of coming through to hospital. This is what it looks like on fluoroscopy. It's actually pretty easy to see. Uh, if you have the lights down, as you would in a cath lab. That's what it looks like on echo, and uh, Greg has produced some beautiful pictures from the cases that have been done in Brisbane with left to right flow, and that's what it looks like on MRI. And this is kind of a nice picture because you can see here the hypertensive left atrium, and you can see there the, the sort of normotensive right atrium, and um, you can see that there is baby bear. There's just the right amount of flow through that, and that's why it's designed. Sorry, baby bear. Okay, so um, has this been shown to help anyone? Uh, Gert Hassenfuss, who's um, currently the president of the Cardiac Society of Europe, Cardiac Failure Society of Europe, was the first author on this first in man publication of this device that was in The Lancet a couple of months ago, and I'll share those data with you. Now, uh, in device development, gee, I've learned much more about device development than I thought I'd ever know. Uh, Obviously, the first thing you have to prove to the European regulators is safety. So every one of these first-in-man studies is a safety study, and we had, like everyone does, a primary safety endpoint. And the safety endpoint that was set up by the European regulators for this device was the percent of subjects who experienced an MACCE, which was death, stroke, or MI, or a systemic embolic event, or subjects who required the surgical implant, uh, their implant removed by surgery within six months from the day of implant. And we implanted it in 64 patients for this study, which was the mandated number. And fortunately, none of those things happened. Uh, did anything good happen? This was a safety study, not an efficacy study, but I'll show you the efficacy data. Okay, so on the right is what happens after the implant. So there's the cardiac output at rest, goes up a little bit. There's the cardiac output after exercise, goes up a little bit. Remember, we were worried it would go down because of the loss of preload, went up a little bit. Um, what happened to the wedge pressure? You can see there's a scatter, but it went down by an average of two and a half millimetres mercury at rest from an average of 16. But what was more impressive was that it went down on exercise. You can see the p-value there. But the patients were able to exercise more. This is at six months. So their exercise capacity went up. Their wedge pressure at peak exercise went down. So if you normalise their wedge pressure for the amount of exercise they did, it went down quite a lot. Okay, a p-value of 0.01, and an impressive five millimetre reduction in LA pressure at peak exercise in this pilot experience. Having shown you the results, I'll show you what the patients were like. Uh, sorry, no, the, the functional class improved. Um, you can see that at baseline, they were mostly functional class three and some twos, and afterwards we had some ones and predominantly twos. So they improved by an average of functional class one. Uh, this thing, MLWHF, is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. We didn't make that up. Someone in Minnesota did, obviously. Um, but the, the higher the score, the worse you are. Um, anything over 40 is pretty bad, anything under 30 is pretty good, and it went from 49 to 32. 
over six months. The six minute walk distance went up by an average of 40 meters and the exercise time went up by an average of one and a half minutes. So in this safety study, we also found effectiveness in terms of, now is it placebo? Some of the things could be. But their class, their, func their functional capacity and their quality of life improved as well as their wedge pressure dropping and their exercise time increasing. Um, they were a very typical HEFPEF population, more females, average age of 69. You can see their LVEF there and their BMI was 33 and a lot of them had had AF or hypertension. A very, very typical HEFPEF population. Um, now, so the, we also followed them up at 12 months and these were our headline data. The percent of subjects who have successful device implantation defined as deployment, um, there were two that couldn't be implanted. One had a very thick septum, and in the other, the device was maldeployed in the left atrium, but it was captured by a snare, pulled back over the wire, and a second device was put in. I should say that the average procedural time from the time of transeptal to the delivery of the device is seven minutes. It's a very quick procedure. So the percent of subjects who had a reduction of wedge pressure at rest and on exercise, plus demonstration of left to right flow through the device at six months. Uh, all of them had left to right flow and 71% had reduction of wedge pressure at rest on on exercise. So it is very early days for this device. We believe that the right patients to, well, I'll tell you a story. I've got one minute for a story. I, saw, I look after congenital heart disease, but occasionally heart failure. A 70-year-old lady, you saw her while I was away. A 70-year-old lady with hypertension, obesity, and diabetes went to visit her sister-in-law in Geelong, got acute pulmonary edema. She's had an ablation for AFib. She's got long-standing HEFPEF. She can now only walk about 100 meters, and she's got a stiff heart and a big left atrium. She's the ideal person for this device, and so we hope we'll put it into her, and we hope we help her. There is a sham controlled trial underway, mandated by the FDA. That means half the people get the device, half the people get a sham, obviously. And there are two Australian sites, one in Melbourne, one in Sydney. Anyone who thinks they've got a patient who might need this device, come and see me afterwards, and we hopefully we'll get them into the trial. So HEFPEF has no proven effective treatments until now. And we hope, we hope, let me be circumspect, we believe that the IASD, the intraatrial septal device, may be a novel solution to reduce LA pressure symptoms and events in this growing population. Thank you.